Hi everyone. This week in lab, you will be doing the neurological assessment. So a lot of this is going to be reviewed from NR302 because a lot of it's the cranial nerves, but we'll also be adding on the deep tendon reflexes. Uh, so these two, deep tendon reflexes is one check off, and then the cranial nerves are another check off. With that, you may have this in different weeks. Um, it could end up being in week five that you'll get checked off on one of them or on both of them. Or there's also a notation on the course calendar that says anywhere you have extra time in the lab, uh, your lab instructor may try to fit it in there. Especially because we have sim lab week four and we want you to have extra time to practice for your head to toe, which those return demonstrations begin week six and week seven. So with the cranial nerves, the first one, we have cranial nerve one. Cranial nerve one is going to be our sense of smell. So you will have your patient close their eyes and you can have some type of uh, something that has a scent to it. The book talks about you want it to be something that's easily identifiable, but you want it to be non-irritating. Uh, we do have some cinnamon in the lab, so you can either do cinnamon or you can sort of make up uh, something, have your lab partner say that it smells like oranges or anything like that. So you have them close their eyes and not show them what you're putting in front of their nose first, but have them close their eyes and then you'd say, what, can you please identify this smell? And they say, yeah, that smells like an alcohol wipe. Then you would say cranial nerve one is intact. For cranial nerve two, that is our sight, that visual acuity. So we have the Snell and eye chart. So if you remember the Snell and eye chart from NR302, you would have the patient stand 20 feet away, cover up one eye, read the lowest line that they can read accurately, cover up the other eye and have them read the lowest line they can read accurately. And then you would be able to determine their visual acuity from that. So, and then you would be able to say that cranial nerve two is intact. Next, you have cranial nerves three, four, and six. That is going to be our cat whisker test. So you can have your patient follow an object with just their eyes, and you will have them follow. It could be a pen light, it could be your finger, but you would go out, center, side, center, down, center, and the other side, up, center, side, center, down, center, making sure they can go in those six cardinal fields of vision. If they can move their eyes in all those directions in a smooth, coordinated fashion, you will say the patient has smooth, coordinated movement with no presence of nystagmus or strabismus. So cranial nerves three, four, and six are intact. So the next you will do cranial nerve five. So with cranial nerve five, there's a motor and a sensory component. The motor component of cranial nerve five is that jaw movement, that temporomandibular joint, having them open, close, move the jaw side to side, protract and retract. They can move their jaw in all those directions, the motor component is intact. The other portion of cranial nerve five, the sensory component, since it's the trigeminal nerve, it innervates the face in three different sections, the forehead, cheek, and chin. So you have their, your lab partner close their eyes and you will have them identify where you are touching them with a the cotton swab. So they would say right forehead, left chin, right cheek, left cheek, right chin, left forehead. And you want to do it in a randomized order bilaterally. If they have full sensation in all three areas, the forehead, cheek, and chin, and they have full jaw movement, then cranial nerve five is intact. Then we have cranial nerve seven. Remember, cranial nerve seven also has a motor and a sensory component. The sensory component is taste. We won't be testing that in the lab. The sensory component of cranial nerve seven you're going to ask your partner to smile, frown, puff out their cheeks, open up their eyes really wide, close their eyes shut really, really tight. If they can do all of those facial expressions, then cranial nerve seven is intact. For cranial nerve eight, the sensory component is here. So you could do the whisper test, where you would stand about arm's length behind your patient, have them include one ear, and you will whisper two words, and see if they can identify the two words you whisper. Then, st still standing arm's length behind, have them include the other ear and whisper two different words. If they can identify both of those words, then the whispered sounds are heard bilaterally and the sensory component of cranial nerve eight is intact. Then for the motor component, that's balance and equilibrium. So that's the Romberg test. You will have your patient stand feet shoulder width apart and have them close their eyes. And you will be watching to make sure that they don't sway, that they don't lose their balance, that they don't widen their base of stance. If they do not do any of those things, then Romberg is negative. And if Romberg is negative and whisper sounds are heard bilaterally, cranial nerve eight is intact. 
Next we have 9 and 10. So 9 and 10 deal with our swallow and gag functioning. So you will want a tongue depressor and a pin line. So you will take the tongue depressor and press down on the patient's tongue as they open their mouth and you'll shine a pin light and have them go, ah. And what you're watching is that the uvula, that middle hangy thing, that when they go, ah, that it lifts with phonation. If the uvula rises with phonation, and if there's no pooling of saliva in the back of their throat, that means they're swallowing their own saliva, then cranial nerves 9 and 10 are intact. Then we have cranial nerve 11. That is our spinal accessory muscle. So that is our ability to lift our shoulders up, down, look to the side, side, tilt the chin forward, back, and then also to lateral lean and lean. If they can move those, their neck in all those directions, and if they can also do strength against resistance, so you can place your hands on their shoulders and have them push up against your resistance, then have them hold their shoulders up and say, don't let me push you down. If they can do that against resistance, then cranial nerve 11 is intact. Then for cranial nerve 12, that is tongue movement. So you can either have your patient stick their tongue out, move it side to side, up and down, or you can have them say light, tight dynamite. If they can say light, tight dynamite, they can move their tongue in all the directions that we care about, then cranial nerve 12 is intact. So that is worth 10 points, cranial nerves 1 through 12. Then the other 10 point check off is the deep tendon reflexes. So the really important thing here is that you try to get your lab partner to relax as much as possible. So you, the practitioner, will need to hold their arm up when you're doing these different locations because if they are holding their own arm up in any way, then they're going to be tightening up those tendons, tightening up those muscles, and you're not going to be able to elicit a response. So I'm mainly going to talk about the locations, and then in lab you will practice different ways that you can hold their arm and different ways to get them to relax if they're unable to relax. And you'll want to do this bilaterally, although I will just show on the one side. So first you have the biceps or the brachial. So if you find that cinnamon rope-like tendon, you will be utilizing the pointy end but you actually want to cover up their tendon so you don't cause any bruising. And so when you hit, your goal is to hit right here, but you will actually hit on the top of your own thumb. So you'll be doing that one indirect. And you will just kind of tap, and you're looking for a flexion of the forearm, that flexion in, and a little flick. And you would say, if it's normal, you would say that the reflex is two plus. Then you have your triceps. So your triceps reflex, you're going to find that where that tricep muscle inserts. So usually that's about three to five centimeters above the electron process, so above that elbow. And you would use the pointy side. Again, you'd have to hold their arm up, so kind of like a scarecrow. And the area that you're hitting is going to be right about here. And when you hit, you're going to be watching for that extension of the forearm. When that tricep muscle contracts, it will extend the forearm. Next, you have the brachial radialis. So the brachial radialis is a few inches above that wrist bone, uh, kind of right here. You'll go a few inches above and a little bit in. You'll have to hold your patient's arm up so that way they can relax. But when you hit, you're gonna look for a little bit of a flick to the wrist. So a little bit of that sort of supination of the wrist as you hit. And that would be two plus as far as the reflexes. Then next, I'm actually going to have a seat you will want to make sure, because for the knee, for the patellar reflex, you don't want your patient's feet to be touching the ground. If their feet are touching the ground, then they're not going to be fully relaxed. So you may have to elevate the bed, so that way your, patient, your patient's feet can be dangling off the bed. This one, you will find the patella, and you will use the flat end. You can use the pointy end if you'd like. I like to use the flat end. And you will hit, and you will see that that quadricep will contract causing that extension of the lower extremity. Okay. And that would be two plus or plus two reflex response. And then you have the last one is your Achilles. So your Achilles, and you will have a patient turn around, you actually lower the bed, turn around and have them dangle their foot off the edge of the bed. And you may have to have them slip off their shoe a little bit. And where you're going for is right here, that Achilles tendon and you will take and you will hit and when you hit that they will plant our flex their foot so they'll kind of flick out and that will be the reflex response and again it's usually right where the top of that shoe is so you may have to have them slip off their shoe and you will just hit 
until it elicits that response. And again, if any of responses are difficult to elicit, try distraction, or you can also try reinforcement, which would be you could give your patient a big pen, because if they are focusing on clicking a big pen, that end of that pen, then they oftentimes relax their other muscles. Or if you're doing the lower extremities, you can have them interlock their fingers and pull out. By tensing up the upper body, they will often relax the lower body. So feel free to let me know if you have any questions or if there's any way that I can assist you. And don't forget the Open Lab is also a really great resource for practicing your skills. Have a great week, and that concludes all of our checkoffs in our 304.